Okay. So we are not yet going to be invited to something similar to this, but we will have the panel discussion now. And I suppose that, uh, right, that's 2.30 to 3 p.m. Okay. Uh, may I request the speakers to sit down in the uh, table there? Okay. So we now have our very varied panel uh, to respond to your questions. I'm not sure how I can group questions together if, uh, because they spoke about very different topics. So maybe uh, let me just first try to ask you, whomever has questions, to line up and state your name. and. Uh, if I think by your question, we will probably know who is supposed to answer, but you can also specify. And then I'll take it about three at a time or four at a time, and then let's see how we're doing. Uh, Gita, you want to start? Yeah, this is a question for Professor Levins. Um, can you say something about how Cuba manages the whole business of drugs and pharmaceuticals? Cuba is mostly a drug distribution route. Airplanes come from the mainland of South America, drop the drugs offshore where they're retrieved by speedboats from Florida. So, uh, <laughs> okay, wait, wait. <laughs> what you see in the Cuban press are accounts of I meant kilos, pharmaceuticals. 50 kilos being found on the beach off Camagüey. Okay. No, my question was about pharma pharmaceuticals. My question was about pharmaceuticals. Mm. <laughs> Cuba manufactures about 40% of their pharmaceutical need, on, and that's done in government-owned go government enterprises. The rest they have to buy in an international market, and they fa favor the markets from Brazil and India. I have a few questions, almost for everybody. Uh, do you want to introduce yourself oh. first, please? I am uh, Tamara Awago, and from Global Health and Population at the Harvard School of Public Health. And Professor Levins has been my mentor for more than 25 years. So. <laughs> okay, I have questions almost for everybody. Uh, for the Rwanda, I wanted to know what the catastrophic events include that are being taken care of by the government. For the Zambia, I wanted to, say, to ask what are the effects of all the interventions that you mentioned on the health distribution of the population? Did they, they have any effects? And um, about Cuba, I want to add something because I have been going there uh, since 1998 every year and it has been the highlight of my annual scientific experience every year. I mean, it's incredible. But what I wanted to add is that Cuba um, contributes to the health of the world, not just to itself. So it has a global understanding of health. For example, it trains medical doctors of poor countries and also of rich countries because poor uh, students who do not have the money to pay for medical school here, they are trained for free in Cuba. The other thing is that Cuba provides most of the vaccines for all Latin America. They actually, they make the vaccines, and that's another way of contributions. Um, they provide the experts on malaria control. And in Africa, they send their experts there. So this global understanding is incredible because they don't get the grants that we all Americans get for, um, 
treating people in other countries or implementing programs in poor countries. They do it for free. Thank you. Uh, why don't we, because we have time, I think, why don't we just get the answers to, to the questions uh, for... I can, I can start from Rwanda. So I don't, I don't know exactly the answer to that, so I can only speak from the experience that we have, which is that um, patients are, are, need to start at the appropriate level, so they go to the health center first. And so long as they are from the health center transferred to the district hospital, then to the regional hospital, my understanding is that they are then covered. I don't know about some of the other ones. I know that there is availability within the um, public sector for some higher level care, things like heart valve replacements and, and other types of major surgery. There's a cancer uh, center that's now been opened that actually provides services as well. But there's a real emphasis on people really utilizing, uh, according, you know, going through the level as opposed to just sort of appearing up at a provincial level. Um, and then the catastrophic was really it's sort of based on some of the self-report from the DHS data that I, that I presented. Uh, your question on Zambia was whether all the interventions have had an impact on equity. Um, I'll answer it two ways. One is when there's so many things going on at the same time or in subsequent years, it's really difficult to tease out the impact of one intervention compared to another intervention. And at the same time, when education has been increasing throughout the country, and you know, there's several studies that show that about 50% of the reduction in child mortality can be attributed to education. It's just really hard to say what has led to the improvement in child mortality. If you look across districts in Zambia, the worst off districts are still doing poorly. The best off districts are doing better. So everybody has gotten better. There's still differences in 5Q0 between the districts. Whether inequality has increased or decreased probably depends on whether you're going to use an absolute or a relative measure. Larry Tamkin is right here. He can probably say a lot more about measures of inequality than I can. So I don't think there's an easy answer to that question. The encouraging thing is that the progress has been seen in every district of the country, but there certainly are areas that could use a lot more focused attention from the ministry. Uh, thank you very much for all the cases that were presented. I have a question for, um, first for Emmanuel about the, you presented that antenatal care in the follow-up was not, um, was decreasing versus the first initial visits. But I wondered about what are the maternal mortality rates. You spoke about child mortality rates improving, but I'm not sure if the maternal mortality rates are decreasing or not. And what are the abortion rates whether they are continuing with their pregnancies or not, giving there is an increase in education in these ages. I had that, these questions in my mind to look at. Uh, my other question is to Professor Richard Levins about um, the, how I understand that the Cuban medical education system is different and going again to the medical education being a part of the health sector reform, which is usually not there in the puzzle addressed. How far can you say that the, a medical education system in Cuba had a role in incentivizing the retention of physicians in their rural posts versus monetary incentives, because monetary incentives have been tried in many countries, and usually there is someone who can pay more. So uh, how can you incentivize medical students who can have better jobs and better pay to keep their rural posts and contribute to the health of their own community through medical education. Thank you. Well, Sorry, you please know. introduce yourself. Uh, um, I'm Ali El Sheikh uh, from Egypt, but I'm studying public administration at a school, Maxwell School, Syracuse University. Thank you. Yes, I don't think you have that kind of income differential by geography in Cuba. It's just part of the me medical service on the regular wage scale. Uh, part of the incentive is that they're trained in low resource medicine. In fact, you find that Cubans will complete their residency while doing service in El Salvador or other places. The account of their work in El Salvador in relation to cholera is particularly interesting because they, even, even though they come from a politically oriented society, their role was not political. Part of their problem was to work together with people from the Salvadoran military and from the alumni from the guerrilla movement. 
and they were successful in bringing these groups together around the problem of dealing with cholera. To answer the question on maternal mortality in Zambia, um, it's, uh, even though it is high in Zambia, it's a relatively rare event, so measuring it at below the national level is super complicated, if not infeasible. We have a tough enough time measuring it at the national level. So it would be really difficult to actually <laughs> track changes in maternal mortality at the subnational level. Um, that said, we don't really know why women show up for the first antenatal care visit, but not subsequent ones. It may be that they perceive they're not really getting much out of the care at the facilities, or there may be other reasons. The skilled birth attendance rate has stayed flat throughout this time period, so the same proportion of births are happening in health facilities over time. We have no information on abortions. As you may be aware, the demographic and health surveys and other similar national surveys do not really ask those types of questions in most countries. Um, but it is a plausible theory that they may have gone up. It wouldn't explain the reduction from 80% to about 40% over a 20-year period. The abortion rate would had to go through the roof to explain that. So I don't think it's the main driver. It might be one of the drivers, but we don't really have any information on it. In Puerto Rico, what we found was that it's a balance between urgency and inconvenience. The transportation to the clinic can take a whole day, and you have to make arrangements for kids, so the waiting room is full of kids who are not being treated. And so people will go the first time because they consider it es essential, and then after that, the inconvenience piles up, and the cost. If you miss the mail truck, then you, can't, you lose your appointment and so on. Okay, and uh, just I'll take my chair's prerogative. It's interesting that in Cuba, you mentioned that there are 11 visits per pregnancy. Yeah. That's, uh, I think that brings the question really of uh, how many visits do you, <laughs> is ideal, or what's the effectiveness of, of this visit? Has it contributed to that? Uh, I'm sure there are many more contributors to that very low maternal, mort uh, sorry, uh, child mortality. But uh, um, that's amazing for 11 visits per pregnancy. When the economy collapsed, there was a lot of malnutrition. And part of the purpose of these visits was to provide additional food to pregnant uh -huh. women. Okay. 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 And up to now, that's still no, being I, done? I don't know what's happening recently. Okay. Dan, sorry. Go ahead. Um, Dr. Pierpol, in one of your slides showed priorities for the universal coverage plan. One was uh, services that um, might not be very cost effective, but very likely to bankrupt a uh, family. You said uh, as long as they don't have a big impact on the national budget. Now, of course, <laughs> the next the question then is, well, what about services that have those two characteristics, not very cost effective, but very likely to impoverish a family, and it would have a big impact. And of course, dialysis is the case I'm thinking about. So yes. some years ago, um, uh, the UC plan did not offer dialysis, and the two other plans did. And there was widespread resentment of this by people in the UC plan. Uh, and the, the um, Ministry of Public Health um, proposed to offer it only in cases where it would be most cost effective. By that they meant people who were as a bridge to transplant. Now the problem there was that hardly anyone ever got a transplant, so that didn't really help too much. So they abandoned that plan, as I understand it. Now, uh, uh, the thing about the, the dialysis is that once your kidney is shut down, you die unless you get on it. And if you get on it, you have to keep paying unless you have insurance. Um, and uh, it, it, if, when your money runs out, that's the end of it for you if it's private. So it's very dramatic for the people who are involved and for their families. And at some point, the ministry simply said that they would now include it. But there's been articles in the press in the bulletin of the World Health Organization saying that in the years since then, the cost of dialysis is becoming a serious problem in, in the UC plan, or at least it was at the time the article was written. So I wonder if, if you could say something about 
how this decision was handled then and, and now, and whether others who've been observing other health systems can make any observations about what to do with a life-saving essential health service like dialysis, um, which really is beyond the, the ability of most um, people in these countries to think about pain, but which is perhaps not cost-effective enough to count as a, as a good best buy for the national health system. Six years ago, uh, we predicted we can, we must have more and more CKD people in Thailand. Chronic renal failure, much higher, very rapidly. We have to do something. We do two things. First, we predicted and asked the government for a 10-year plan to cover insurance to those people who may go bankruptcy with uh, and with, with, with dialysis. The second we do with CKD prevention to prevent chronic renal failure. We try to find out DM people very, very soon and control the it and control DM in the good level. So the government accept 10-year plan. It is a uh, political agenda, not real economic agenda. It sounds for people because when, when one in the family got chronic renal failure, failure uh, the family suffers, suffers for those patients. They have to pay from their pocket and then bankruptcy. So I, I, I don't know why the government accept it, but it accepts six years ago, now is a long-term plan in Thailand. And we t another thing we do, we promote peritoneal dialysis. We, we can introduce and teach people do dialysis by themselves with less cost in Thailand. Hopefully. When we were working with the Ministry of Health on this issue back in the uh, uh, last dec uh, last uh, in the late 2000, they estimated that uh, to fully fund uh, all who were in need of dialysis would take about 23 percent of the total health budget. Uh, so, j just to put it in context, how how do you, did they simply ignore that when they made the 10-year commitment? Uh, or did they, did they really think that they were going to spend 23% of the total health budget on dialysis, which is a relatively small number of, of patients? We can control only $120 million per year, not too much. It's only 3% of total, 3% of total health insurance budget. That's what it is now. now. Only three percent because we use peritoneal dialysis. We promote peritoneal dialysis. We not, do, do not promote hemodialysis. We, you have to bring patients to the hospital and use machine, use nephrologists, use nurses to take care of people. If we use peritoneal dialysis, we can teach people and family and do themselves in the in the in the house. That's cheaper. I'm uh, Ole Nordheim, uh, University of Bergen. I have a question for Lisa Hirshorn. Um, it's often regarded as very difficult to finance uh, health in African countries to collect tax revenue or introduce health insurance. So maybe you could say a little bit about how they managed to do that in Rwanda. I can try. I'm a little bit at a disadvantage uh, since my sort of focus has really been much more on the provision side as opposed to the, the finance side. I think it's been a bit of a, of a, of a struggle there because um, the initial, I think, goal was to make it uh, self-sustaining. And as the uh, focus has been on both quality and expansion, um, the amount of copay is actually going up a bit. And I'd say it's, it's probably um, a work in progress, I think is the way I'd put it. 
sorry, does anybody know better in Rwanda to, who, who can respond to this question? Okay, go ahead, Peter. Okay, thanks. Uh, Peter Berman from Harvard School of Public Health. And this is a question for any or all of the panelists. So, you know, so, so far, although not all, but a lot of the conversation today has been talking about UC as if it's like a zero one variable, like you either have UC or you don't have UC. Uh, but I think these these country examples have showed us that it's not a zero one variable. There are many stages uh, and levels of coverage. Um, but one of the things that I think is interesting to point out is the differences in the absolute resources that are available for health in these countries and others we've heard about today. And I just want to illustrate that with a couple of examples. I mean, both Zambia and Rwanda are countries that benefit from a very high degree of external aid. Rwanda's government health expenditure is e equal to about three times India's government health expenditure per capita. But most of that money comes from external resources. So that's a lot of difference, threefold, a threefold difference in per capita health spending on the government side. Uh, Cuba, I think, is an interesting example. As, a, as a, a socialist state, there's a lot of social control over resources, so you don't see the same levels of prices and spending and so on. But those are real resources, and we've seen there are constraints on those resources even when they're not priced in a market. We've seen that in China when China transitioned from a, from a socialist economy to a market economy, and the rural health care suffered greatly because suddenly resources had to be paid for that previously had been commanded uh, by the state. Um, and in Thailand, we've seen this evolution. When Thailand's spending today is, again, as I recall, somewhere around three or four times what Rwanda's spending is. So uh, we really have quite a range here. And I wanted to ask the panelists if they would comment a bit upon how those absolute resource differences and levels and types of resources might affect the way we think about UC in these different settings. Shall we take it from Lisa going to Dr. Pierpo? We spend 6% of GDP now, and we spend 40% of government budget. I think we, we, we touch the ceiling. Ceiling? The ceiling of budget. So we have to use, to spend our money wisely and try to control more and more the quality and the budget. It is, it's difficult to see this because we are going to be an aging society. People live longer. I hope to live at least 80 years. So we have to prepare our country to be an aging society. How can we do this under, under this? But maybe luckily, our GDP grows 2.5 times than 10 years in the past. If we can grow in this, uh, this speed, we can cope with uh, the aging society. If we cannot, we can think about to search another way. Because economy is, it is it's not sure. It's not sure. Sometimes we think well, we, we can, we can go rapid, steadily, but sometimes we have crisis. So back to the basic, we have to choose. We have to use cost efficiency analysis to 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 choose another health intervention anymore. Uh, may I exercise again my chair's prerogative? Dr. Pierpol, why do you think, or why do you say that you think 6% is the ceiling? Why the ceiling? Maybe just my feeling. It's okay. <laughs> Just please I, explain. I, I, I work in this area for 12 years and have a chance to talk to, to people, to friends in many countries. We think we have to, to use, to, to spend money in other sites, on education, on other facilities, not on health only. So how much is I think it's different from country to country. In Thai, we, we think now the facility, the health outcomes is, is quite, maybe not good, but fair. We're happy with health status. Mm. So we, we, we have to control it. Uh, we, we cannot 
have any research just to to tell you the exact number. But we grow from 3.5 to 6 in 12 years. So we have to slow down. And maybe, I think we, we touch the ceiling. Dr. Lippins? Well, Cuba, like a lot of other countries, is an aging population. And one of the things that, it, that aging does is hit the rural population hardest. That is, older farmers don't like farming anymore. Farming is physically stressful. Uh, there are a lot of other occupations that are, di that are difficult to recruit aging people in. And so part of the answer is the redesign of work, to make the work itself more, more satisfying and more acceptable to people who are older. And that involves diversification of agriculture so that you're not doing the same operation all day long and uh, integrating more the physical and the intellectual labor in production. This is both urban and rural. But the problem, the problem still remains that there are, we, there's an expectation of rising demand on the health system unless you can compensate it with improving general health. So it's a, it's a matter which is not solved in Cuba, but is under discussion. Um. Yeah, thank you, Peter, for that question. So exactly what I've been thinking too. In a country where, like Zambia, where about 50% of the total spending on health comes from development assistance for health, and even more than that, it predominantly comes from the Global Fund, PEPFAR, and PMI, the President's Malaria Initiative. So not only are they reliant on development assistance, but it's also mostly earmarked. There is some room for creativity as to how you spend that money, but very low room, and there's increasing pressure from the donors to spend the money for the purpose that the funds were intended to. So there's not much room at the Ministry of Health to um, put the resources where they may feel the biggest needs are. And David Evans is not here, but maybe I'll take my speaker's prerogative and bounce the question off to Tessa from WHO about what WHO has in mind when they talk about universal coverage in a setting where such a big proportion of the funding for health comes from external sources and ones that may be less flexible as time goes on than they have been. Uh, you want me to answer now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Please. I, I really don't know the answer, but that is a real concern, particularly now with uh, the Global Fund, with their new funding mechanism. Although they're saying that uh, they will support, uh, well, in Zambia, I'm sure they have to stick very closely to the Global Fund because of their history uh, with Global Fund grants. Um, so, I really, I think many countries realize this. That's why many countries are trying to employ creative mechanisms. Like Ethiopia, I believe, actually use a lot of the global fund monies to, to build infrastructure. So when people claim the success of Ethiopia is with the health extension workers, a large part of that also has been a rolling out of infrastructure. That's. That's not really, that was quite creative use of global fund monies. So this was used before, but now in this climate where there is real slowing down of uh, aid and uh, the global fund is really basically saying that uh, you have, we have our own deliverables as a funding agency. If you read the new funding model of, of the Global Fund. It basically s almost specifies the uh, interventions to be funded uh, in HIV, TB, and malaria, what they call their investment cases, the ones which actually are the most cost effective from their perspective. And then they have very, all of the health systems uh, preferably should be, well, they didn't say preferably, they say can be incorporated within the uh, disease grants itself, and then they have a bonus if you're able to prove that you're investing in these specific diseases, your domestic resources, then you can avail of some extra monies for health systems. But that's, 
that wasn't the plan really before. The plan before was there was a health systems window. And uh, there you could have more leeway in terms of what you could invest as long as you could very peripherally tie it to HIV, TB, and malaria. So I, it, it really is very hard. So in fact, some of the um, metrics in terms of the spending really is uh, some people have done an analysis and actually looked at uh, some, some have correlated. This is particularly work in PAHO where they've said that five to six, about five to six percent um, uh, of the government as a percent of, let me see, five to six percent uh, should be going to actually as a percent of GDP. So that is why I was actually pushing Dr. Pirapol. This is domestic spending. And because as you say, most of the donor funds are earmarked. So you're talking about primarily Gavi, which has big monies now on immunization, and that's why they're rolling out, including HPV, okay, for cervical cancer. So you're sort of starting to think about, well, really, what are, what are this actually addressing? And then you have HIV monies and malaria monies and a little of the TB monies. So uh, it's a very tough call for the countries. I think it's if, if somebody is willing to give you money, it's very hard to refuse it, even if you know that there will be distortions within the health system. But if it's money is being given, I think for many of these countries, it will be accepted. And in the ways that even with, um, I think what we're trying to do is not really, uh, I, I could bounce back the question to you about additionality of this and whether the government is actually uh, making some adjustments to when HIV is being funded, malaria is being funded, or uh, immunization is being funded, whether they are reallocating within their health budgets or even outside their health budgets. So I think there are still creative ways of dealing with this, but it's not at all the ideal situation, and I think everybody knows it. This is not where the country can exercise real ownership. And if you have 50% of your health expenditures coming from donors, it's really very hard to exert your country ownership. Lisa? So, again, I, I don't want to sort of speak for the government, so I'm really speaking about this more as, as an implementer and somebody who's sort of focused on quality and, and the observations, which is that in Rwanda it's been which is, you know, obviously a much lower prevalence, zero prevalence country in terms of HIV, but has obviously benefited yeah. from, from Global Jeez. Fund and from, from PEPFAR initiative, that there's a real, um, I think, strategic focus on the government to figure out what are the main uh, causes of morbidity and mortality and then go after them. And so, for example, maternal health and under five, and then the utilization of, of task sharing, so community-based IMCI is an example, the use of, of Agence Santé Maternelle to actually get women to come in, uh, and now the recognition that, like many countries, Rwanda's hit a, uh, a point with under five mortality where we need to go after neonatal mortality, so that's a new initiative. And then sort of looking at the aging, the fact that now there is a, a national strategic plan for and non-communicable chronic diseases. So. It's, it's been, I'm not sure how they're going to pay for it, but it's been very, I think, um, uh, effective use of, of data and of sort of strategic approaches to understand what are some of the uh, challenges that are current and what are the challenges that are, that are coming up and sort of going after figuring out ways of effectively doing them with the limited resources that they have. Do you have time? Or? Yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, Richard Cash. Uh, and, uh, sorry, I'll just uh, signal that Rita is the last one. Okay. Um, I want to go with the, uh, build on Peter's comment because we, and, and particularly with manpower, health manpower, because we have four very different uh, uh, strategies up here. Cuba is almost, at least unless it's changed since I was last there, it's almost entirely physician based. Thailand has an extremely vigorous nursing uh, uh, community. Uh, and then, Lisa, you asked the question, what about this task shifting movie over? And I imagine Zambia has a large brain drain of uh, physicians, at least, unless you're different than a lot of those 
southern African countries where the physicians are going south to South Africa or elsewhere. So is there any evidence that the delivery of services by all other things being equal, given what you can pay for, makes any difference whether it's all physicians or much more nursing based or uh, task shifting because uh, the health manpower, of course, next to drugs is your number one uh, uh, expenditure. So you ask the question and I'll turn it back to you. Is there any evidence at all that it makes any, whether doctors deliver uh, ARTs or whether nurses deliver it? Uh, what is the evidence? Because I know I do a lot of work in Bangladesh and frankly almost all of the DOTS program is run not by doctors, not by nurses, but by community health workers and it's probably one of the best programs in the world. So it's, I think it's a really, really interesting question, something that we spend a lot of time. So the answer is it depends. Um, and in certain things which are relatively protocol driven that don't require a lot of judgment, if anything, nurses and potentially community health workers with supervision and with adequate supply chains to make sure that they have the resources can give as good or better care. And a lot of times if we're talking about access to the most vulnerable, uh, they'll actually do better because they'll actually go out there. The challenge is, which is sort of has to go with, well, what's the depth of care that you can give? And so there's, v I think, very strong evidence to say in first-line antiretroviral therapy, in uh, basic surgery, that it's as good if not better. But when you get to things like, for example, second-line treatment for HIV or more complicated surgical procedures uh, or things which actually require sort of problem solving, I actually believe we can teach nurses, and if you sort of work with advanced nurse practitioners here, I think they're as good or better, but it requires a somewhat change in, in the way that the nursing um, uh, pedagogy is, is taught in a, lot of these, in a lot of these countries in terms of the ability to do problem solving as opposed to, stick to a, sticking to a protocol. So I'm, I'm optimistic, but I think it's going to take a change in terms of how people view it, not just from the ministry, not just from the schools, but also from the physicians uh, and the nurses themselves in terms of changing some of the hierarchy that exists. Uh, Dr. Levine? In Cuba, there were some attempts in the early years to introduce more paramedical participation, and in general it was not acceptable to the population. So they've reverted to a physician-based system, uh, not out of choice, but out of popular preference. And I think in, in many of this as well, we, we have to be careful about what we actually, how we actually classify the cadres because what we describe as a physician in, in some might be different in, in the others. Uh, so um, please, the last question. Ritu will ask her question in another session. Hi, I'm Karen Feinberg and I'm an independent consultant researcher, Harvard affiliated and some of my cross-cutting work connects to innovation and development. And um, a sub-theme the past year has been understanding medical technology innovation, for instance. And one of the sessions I went to, there was some discussion around how an innovator and a business person is going to get reimbursement. And that's a consideration as to how they get their um, innovation deployed and diffused. So I'm thinking to myself, and as, as I'm listening to this, depending on the needs of the country, of course, and the issues. And I have met many, uh, many a global innovator, truly. Um, and some of the innovators are within the medical field and, and health field. And so I'm thinking if an innovator has this amazing innovation that could help system-wide health issues, I'm thinking about the payment set of issues and how what kind of mechanisms could be set up in this kind of universal health care that could make the country evaluate the medical technology, how would it be paid for, how would training be paid for to diffuse it into the country. So I'm thinking a lot about that and wonder if anybody can address those issues. Um, may I ask Thailand to answer this? Dr. Kirapol, you want to speak about HITAP on oh. technology? And yes, we have the, the Health Intervention and Technology Program. So we can uh, we can choose what interventions, what technology is suitable for Thailand. And we can know, we can study the real cost of any intervention and, and, and program, such as we negotiate HPV vaccine 
before launching in Thailand. Now we did not agree with the pharmaceutical company because uh, they try to sell more expensive that than we can accept the price. Okay. Uh, does anybody else in the panel wish to respond to that question, or? This is part of the more general issue that for all developing countries, developing science, the problem is how to be part of universal science and yet maintain intellectual independence. Both of these are important. Copying the foreign ways don't work, if only because there's overkill in technology. Uh, so there has to be innovation, particularly in low resource. Uh, medicine. At the same time, you don't want to uh, have a chauvinistic view toward, toward science just because it's from outside. So this is a, this is a really alive, alive question in Latin American countries, particularly where nationalism is stronger. And I understand it's also true in Pakistan, where there's a sense of an autonomous Islamic science uh, that is under, undermining the development of their own uh, autonomous science. It's still an, it's a, an unresolved issue as to how to maintain the intellectual independence when so much of the medical people are being trained in uh, the temperate zone centers in Washington, Paris, and London for work in the tropics. Okay. Uh, Dr. Pienpol, yeah. Oh, for, first of all, I, I agree with him because in Thai experience, we think 800 items of medicine is enough for our nation essential drug list. But in other countries, it should be not enough. So it, it depends on country. We have to, 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 to create our intellectuals to think, to, to, uh, to intervene our country. We cannot copy from other countries. Okay. Uh, we'll end this session and we'll have about uh, 10 15 minutes uh, coffee break. Thank you very much to our speakers. They have brought a wealth of uh, insight from different countries.